the 11th Hussars. He actually spent five years as a regular soldier, and I was quite pleased to, uh, to know that he started off as, uh, uh, as a soldier that I think gives him a unique uh, uh, insight uh, into uh, the military mind, and I, s I have a, a feeling that uh, that also contributes to uh, his uh, uh, spectacular success as uh, a writer. He uh, served in the army for five years before uh, leaving the army to write. And uh, he has been remarkably successful at uh, uh, what he does. He's, uh, uh, he's written four uh, novels and over 10 books of uh, nonfiction. And uh, his works have uh, been translated into over 30 languages and have sold uh, over a staggering six million copies. And uh, uh, if anyone, if, I mean, if you, if, even if you have a passing interest in the history of uh, the previous century and the events that shaped it, and particularly the Second World War, it's exceedingly unlikely that uh, you would not have uh, heard or come across a book by uh, Anthony Beaver. I. Um, uh, very quickly before, uh, Anthony today is going to talk to us about uh, the Second World War uh, and how uh, it shaped as a, as a global um, uh, phenomena. But since we're here in India, I thought I'd very, very briefly and very quickly touch upon how, uh, uh, what the war meant to India. Um, in India, uh, uh, the war was played out against a, a backdrop of immense political churning, uh, uh, there was, um, which had a great impact not just on the British Raj, but also on the people of this subcontinent. Um, and in, against this backdrop, uh, we raised an army of uh, two and a half million men, and each man uh, was a volunteer. It was, in fact, uh, the largest volunteer uh, force in the history of human conflict. And uh, Indian divisions served. Uh, it's actually not very well known that uh, the <coughs> excuse me, the Indian Army uh, had a contingent that served uh, with the British Expeditionary Force in France in 1940. Um, uh, and but apart from that, uh, we served in East Africa, in Sudan, in Eritrea, in uh, uh, North Africa, the Western Desert, in the Middle East with the P Pai Force, with Persia and Iraq. Um, subsequently, of course, Burma, the Far East and Italy. Um, we lost over 90,000 men dead, um, and they have uh, largely been written out of history uh, for a variety of reasons, and I'm not going to go into that at this point in time. But um, I, I do hope, I mean, there's a story over there, and at some point in time, um, maybe, you know, I'm throwing down the gauntlet, maybe he'll pick it up. So uh, uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Anthony Beaver. Rana, thank you. Every country has their own perspective on the Second World War. This is not surprising when experiences and memories are so different. For Americans, the war began in December 1941. Russians believe that it started only in June 1941. Most Europeans, on the other hand, consider that it commenced in Poland in September 1939. But for the Chinese, it started in 1937 with the Sino-Japanese War. And many in Spain are still convinced that it began in 1936 with General Franco's nationalist rising to overthrow the Spanish Republic. Some historians extend the conflict even further, arguing over the long war of the 20th century. Did that last from 1914 to 1945? or from the Russian Revolution in 1917 until the collapse of the Soviet Empire in 1989. Most people see the Second World War as a monstrous state-on-state -state clash between the major powers. Yet it was also an international civil war, especially affecting those countries which had been occupied. And many countries faced a potential, or in some cases a real civil war, after the defeat of the Axis powers in 1945. The fact is that the Second World War was a conglomeration of many different conflicts. It was also worth remembering that it suddenly brought world history together, not just through the global reach of the war, but because of the, its consequences 
in dramatically accelerating the end of colonialism in Asia and in Africa. I don't start in my book with the story of the Nazi invasion of Poland, as you might have expected. I begin a month earlier in August 1939, when the Japanese army in Mon Manchuria clashed with the Red Army on the Mango Mongolian border at the river of Khalkin Gol. In comparison with the vast engagements which came later, this battle was comparatively small, but it influenced the whole course of the war. General Zhukov, in his first combat command, inflicted such a defeat on the Japanese that they decided not to attack north against Siberia, as many Japanese army officers had wanted. Instead, the Imperial Japanese Navy would later prevail with its plans to attack south against British and Dutch colonies and the American Pacific bases. It also meant that in the early winter of 1941, the Japanese refused to help when the Germans asked them to attack the Soviet Far East to tie down Stalin's Siberian armies as the Wehrmacht advanced on Moscow. The conflict stretched from the North Atlantic to the South Pacific, from the snowfields of Norway and Finland to the Libyan desert, from jungle fighting in Burma and on the islands and atolls of the Pacific Rim, to SS Einsatzgruppen in the borderlands and Gulag prisoners drafted into punishment battalions. For those involved in the fighting in one place, battles on the other side of the world could have been taking place on another planet. And when it came to the unspeakable cruelties of the Sino-Japanese War, they could have been taking place in the Dark Ages. In the Far East, some 15 million Chinese died at the hands of the Japanese. Some Chinese historians claim that the true figure is far higher, even 40 million, but I think that's rather suspect in the way that some Russian historians tried to push the Soviet Union's losses to a similar level on the basis of projected population growth. In Europe, we think of the appalling treatment of Western prisoners of war by the Japanese in the Far East. Yet local populations endured a far worse suffering. On the Burma Railway, a third of Allied prisoners of war died, but well over half of the forced uh, population, of the forced laborers, uh, perished. Today, it's very hard to appreciate the huge historical forces which killed some 60 to 70 million people. When we dwell on the enormity of the Second World War and its victims, we try to absorb all those statistics of national and ethnic suffering. The Poles lost nearly 6 million people, almost a fifth of their population in the Second World War. And this was proportionally more even than the Soviet Union although in Belarus the loss rate went up to a quarter of the population. Reliable estimates of total Soviet losses now vary between 24 and 26 million dead. Stalin knew in 1945 that they exceeded 20 million, but he tried to conceal this. In the words of Professor David Reynolds, he settled for 7.5 million as a figure that sounded suitably heroic but not criminally homicidal. The statistics of suffering and the sheer size of the numbers are dangerously numbing, as the writer Vasily Grossman instinctively understood. In his view, the duty of survivors was to try to recognize the millions of ghosts from the mass graves as individuals, not as nameless people in caricatured categories, because that sort of dehumanization was precisely what the perpetrators had sought to achieve. But focusing on the dead makes us overlook the way that the Second World War changed the lives of survivors, sometimes in ways impossible to predict. In the Archive Nationale in Paris, I came across a short paragraph in a June 1945 report by the French security police, the DST. This recorded that a German farmer's wife had been found in Paris, having somehow smuggled herself onto a train returning French deportees and concentration camp victims from Germany. It transpired that she had had an illicit affair with a French prisoner of war assigned to their farm in Germany while her husband was fighting on the Eastern Front. She'd fallen so much in love with this enemy of her country that she'd followed him to Paris, where she was picked up by the French police. <laughs> 
And that was all the detail provided. But these few lines raised so many questions. Would her difficult journey have been in vain, even if she had not been picked up by the police? Had her lover given her the wrong address because he was already married? And had he returned home, as quite a few did, to find that his wife had had a baby in his absence by a German soldier? A recent book in France estimated that around 100,000 babies, known as enfants de guerre, had been fathered by German soldiers during the occupation. In any case, the bare bones of the story could almost have been a novel by Marguerite Duras. It is, of course, a tiny tragedy in comparison to the horrors of the Eastern Front and the war in China. But it remains a poignant reminder that of the consequences of decisions by leaders such as Stalin and Hitler ripped apart the traditional fabric of existence. Many aspects are not as they appear on the surface, as I've learned over the years. I remember as a young officer in Germany, based next door to Belsen concentration camp, being horrified by a memorial to French Jews who died there. And it said, aux Juifs Français qui sont morts pour la gloire et la patrie. I found the idea of French Jews dying for glory and the fatherland quite grotesque in a concentration camp. And many years later, I mentioned this to the French historian Henri Rousseau. And he replied, I entirely understand your reaction, but you're completely wrong. It was the French Jews themselves who insisted after the war that their memorials, the memorials to their dead, should have exactly the same wording as those of all the other French. And this was because they would never forgive Vichy for having tried to take away their French citizenship. The conditions under which men fought were so desperate that today we can hardly imagine how they survived. Even many who were there at the time looked back in amazement. One Red Army officer, Vladimir Ivanovich Tulenev, said recently, nowadays I cannot believe that we were able to live in the trenches, in the open field, on the snow, in the cold, never taking off our shoes or clothes, with no water or source of heat. How on earth did we survive all that? Between 1941 and 1945, some Red Army soldiers, those who survived the battles along the way, fought and marched for some 12,000 kilometers. Soldiers afraid both of their enemy and of execution by their own side were put under a terrible psychological pressure. They and Soviet civilians were ruthlessly crushed between the two totalitarian regimes. Red Army snipers at Stalingrad, for example, example, were ordered to shoot starving Russian orphans who'd been tempted with crusts of bread by German infantrymen to fill their water bottles in the Volga. The proud brutality of Soviet commanders is simply unimaginable in Western democratic societies. When it came to ruthlessness, General Zhukov even exceeded his master Stalin. On the 4th of October 1941, Zhukov, as commander of the Leningrad Front, issued the following order. To make clear to all troops that all families of those who surrendered to the enemy would be shot. Ironically, it did not occur to Zhukov when he issued this order that under it, Stalin himself was in theory liable to execution since his own son, Yakov Zhugashvili, had recently surrendered to the Germans. I don't think Stalin was unduly worried. He simply admired Zhukov for his pitiless determination. But even Zhukov, who'd sent virtually unarmed militia to their certain death against German panzer divisions in 1941, had no idea of the most cynical sacrifice of all in November 1942, which was carried out in his name. While Operation Uranus, the great plan to encircle Paulus's Sixth Army at Stalingrad was being prepared, another offensive, a huge diversion, took shape much further north on the Kalinian and Western fronts against the German Ninth Army. And this was called Operation Mars. The six armies sent into battle as a diversion had virtually no artillery support, while the Stalingrad operation received plenty. And this imbalance suggests a staggering disregard for human life on the part of Stalin. But according to General Pavlov, Pavel Sudoplatov of the NKVD, the ruthlessness went far further. He described how details of Operation Mars were deliberately passed in advance to the Germans, 
Soviet military intelligence had prepared what was called Operation Monastery, an infiltration of the German Abwehr. Alexander Demyanov, the grandson of the leader of the Kuban Cossacks, had been instructed by the NKVD to allow himself to be recruited by German military intelligence. And since his family was well known in white emigre circles, the Germans had already identified him during the Nazi Soviet pact as a possible agent for them. In early November, preparations were well advanced for Operation Uranus around Stalingrad and the diversionary attack of Operation Mars near Zhev. And Alexander Demyanov was now instructed by his NKVD controllers to give the Germans details of Mars. The disinformation planted through Alexander, wrote General Sudoplatov, the NKVD uh, Chief of Administration for Special Tasks, as it was called, was kept secret even from Marshal Zhukov and was handed to me personally by General Fedor Fedotovich Kuznetsov of GRU in a sealed envelope. Zhukov, not knowing that this disinformation game was being played at his expense, paid a heavy price in the loss of thousands of men under his command. This was an understatement. This diversion cost the Red Army 215,674 casualties, just about the same as the total Allied casualties for D-Day and the whole of the Battle of Normandy. It was one of the most heartless sacrifices known in the history of war. Much has been written about the fighting qualities of the different armies in the Second World War, especially the difference between the armies of democracies and the armies of dictatorships. Much less has been said, on the other hand, about their similarities if one studies the performance of average as opposed to elite troops. The evidence indicates, in fact, that only a small proportion of frontline troops actually engage in combat. An initial study in the British Army was carried out in Italy by a Major Lionel Wigram. And Wigram estimated that in most platoons, a small group of men were liable to run away at the first opportunity. Those in the main group in between would follow the fighters if things went well, or the potential deserters if they went badly. And only a very small group actually did the fighting. Mon General Montgomery was so horrified by the report that he had it suppressed. And the Germans, meanwhile, divided their soldiers' combat performance into a very similar categories, but four of them. So it's basically the same as Wigram's breakdown. And American research shortly after the war showed that only a minority of soldiers in a conscript army actually shoot at the enemy. And the Red Army was no different as we found in the Russian archives. Soviet officers argued during the war that a weapons inspection should be carried out immediately after an engagement with the enemy. All those found to have clean barrels should be executed immediately as deserters. Previously, unpublished letters and diaries of the time give us an idea of personal experiences, but they also reveal the attitudes and mentalities holding sway. German officers and soldiers felt that the Wehrmacht was invincible at the start of the war. It never seemed to occur to them that the war which they were bringing so pitilessly to other countries might one day turn back against them and destroy their own homes and families. Their triumphalism in the conquest of France in 1940 was buoyed up by relief that this war on the Western Front was completely unlike the battles of attrition in Flanders a generation earlier. There are many, many German divisions here who haven't fired a shot, a German corporal wrote home, and at the front the enemy are running away. Just imagine Positions like Amiens, Léon, Chemin des Dames are falling within hours. In 1914 to 1918, they were fought over for years. The face of war is dreadful, a German soldier from one infantry division wrote home on the 20th of May. Towns and villages shot to pieces, plundered shops everywhere. Valuables are trodden on with jackboots, cattle are drifting, abandoned, and dogs are slinking despondently along the houses. We live like gods in France. If we need meat, a cow is slaughtered and only the best cuts are taken and the rest is discarded. With our rifles in our hand, we then break into our house and our hunger is sated. Terrible, isn't it? But one gets used to anything. Thank God that these conditions don't prevail at home. The idea that Hitler, the Führer, had spared Germany such horrors was a typical confusion of cause and effect, became a constant refrain 
in soldiers' letters. And that attitude only changed four years later when retribution approached. In the spring of 1941, German soldiers had another rush of military arrogance when they invaded Yugoslavia and Greece. A member of the SS Das Reich wondered, did the Serbs believe that with their incomplete, old-fashioned and badly trained army, they could form up against the German Wehrmacht? That's just like an earthworm wanting to swallow a boar constrictor. The thrill of easy victory was expressed by a German officer with the 11th Panzer Division who wrote to his wife uh, in April, if I saw the enemy, I would fire at them and always experienced a wild, genuine pleasure in fighting. It's a joyous war. We are suntanned and certain of victory. It's a wonderful thing to belong to such a division. A captain with the 73rd Infantry Division reflected that peace would come even to the Balkans with a new European order so that our children would experience no more war, he wrote. And immediately after the first German units drove into Athens on the 26th of April, a huge red swastika flag was raised over the Acropolis. Preparations for the massive assault on the Soviet Union prompted similar hopes of rapid victory. Forests of birch and fir along the Nazi-Soviet frontier concealed vehicle parts, tented headquarters and signal regiments, as well as fighting units. Officers briefed their men, reassuring them that it would take only three or four weeks to crush the Red Army. The unnatural alliance of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was over. Early tomorrow morning, wrote a soldier in the mountain division, we're off, thanks be to God, against our mortal enemy Bolshevism. For me, a real stone has fallen from my heart. Finally, this uncertainty is over, and one knows where one is. I am very optimistic, and I believe that if we can take all the land and raw materials up to the Urals, then Europe will be able to feed itself, and it will not matter how long the war at sea against the British lasts. This war of annihilation, as Hitler called it, was pitiless. The Russian is a tough opponent, wrote a German soldier. We take hardly any prisoners and shoot them all instead. When marching forwards, some took pot shots for fun at crowds of Red Army prisoners being herded back to makeshift camps where they were left to starve in the open. Thousands of Soviet citizens died in the bombing in the cities of Belarus, and survivors fared little better in their attempts to escape eastwards. Beyond the repression and the starvation of ordinary Soviet citizens lay the far darker forces of Himmler's killing squads, the Einsatz Commandos. One day, a German transport Gefreiter, a corporal, accompanied by their company clerk, happened to see men, women, and children with their hands bound together with wire being driven along the road by SS people. They went to see what was happening. Outside a village, they saw a 150-meter trench about three meters deep. Hundreds of Jews had been rounded up. The victims were forced to lie in the trench in rows so that an SS man on each side could walk along, shooting them with captured Soviet submachine guns. Then people were again driven forward, and they had to get in and lie on top of the dead. At that moment, a young girl, she must have been about 12 years old, cried out in a clear, piteous, shrill voice, let me live, I'm still in your child. The child was grabbed, thrown into the ditch, and shot. Only a few managed to flee the killing pits. On the northeastern edge of Ukraine, Vasily Grossman encountered one of them. A girl, he wrote in his notebook, a Jewish beauty who's managed to escape from the Germans has bright, absolutely insane eyes. But the German high command had not bothered to study the lessons of the Sino-Japanese War, and neither had Hitler, who failed to see the very relevant lessons for his own invasion of the Soviet Union four years later. The shock and awe of cruelty does not always stun your opponent into submission. It can also provoke him into a desperate resistance. And if he has a large landmass to withdraw into, a numerically inferior invading army, however excellent and however well equipped, will fail to achieve a decisive victory. By the spring of 1944, the situation had changed completely. The Wehrmacht was in full retreat. Red Army soldiers advancing westwards had much to avenge. Our car passed the body of a woman lying in the snow, an Australian war correspondent noted now Velikia Luki. Our driver did not stop. Such sights are common in the Russian war zone. 
The woman, who had probably fallen out of line while being marched to Germany, had been shot or had died of cold. Who will ever know who she was? She was just one of many million Russians. As the Wehrmacht's retreat continued, nervous breakdown became a much more open subject in letters home to Germany. Psychologically, wrote a gunner in a heavy artillery battery, I'm finding it increasingly hard to manage when you've just been having a good chat with a comrade and half an hour later you see him as little more than scraps of flesh, as if he'd never existed. Or comrades who are lying badly wounded in front of you in a large pool of their own blood and beg you with pleading eyes to help them because in most cases they cannot speak anymore or pain takes away their power of speech. That is terrible. This war is a crushing war of nerves. When in April 1945, the German front line began to break east of Berlin, traumatized survivors ran back shouting, der Ivan kommt. Further back, local farmers and their families also started to flee. Refugees hurry by like creatures of the underworld, wrote a young soldier. Women, children, and old men surprised in their sleep, some only half-dressed. In their faces is despair and deadly fear. Crying children holding their, mother's hand, holding their mother's hands look out at the world's destruction with shocked eyes. As Berliners awaited the arrival of the Red Army, people prepared to meet their conquerors in different ways. Some, farmers, as they left, some fathers, as they left to join their Volkssturm units to defend Berlin, thought only of the fate awaiting their women folk. It's all over, my child, one told his daughter, handing her his pistol. Promise me that when the Russians come, you will shoot yourself. He then kissed her and left. Others killed their wives and children and then committed suicide themselves. In the Far East, before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and Malaya, the appalling complacency and racial arrogance of colonial society had produced a dangerous self-deception among the British. Their fatal underestimation of the Imperial Japanese Army included the idea that all Japanese soldiers were very short-sighted and inherently inferior to Western troops. In fact, they were immeasurably tougher, far more mobile, and astonishingly self-sufficient. They did not need bridging equipment. Their soldiers cut bamboo, thick bamboos, then threw themselves in pairs into the river and bent forward with the bamboos running from shoulder to shoulder in parallel to form a bridge for their comrades to run over. Japanese soldiers had been brought up in a militaristic society. Their mothers had lovingly prepared a what was called a thousand-stitch scarf for them to wear, supposedly to ward off bullets. The whole village or neighborhood paying homage to these martial values would usually turn out to bid farewell to a conscript departing to join the army. Soldiers dreaded disgracing their family and community. And this, according to a number of Japanese historians, was far more powerful than ideas of glory in dying for the emperor. Their basic training was designed to destroy individuality. Recruits were constantly insulted, slapped, and beaten by their sergeants and corporals to toughen them up. In what might be called the knock-on theory of oppression, this treatment was also intended to provoke them to take their anger out on the soldiers and civilians of a defeated enemy. All of them had also been indoctrinated since elementary school to believe that the Chinese were totally inferior to the divine race of Japanese and were below pigs. One Japanese soldier admitted that although he had been horrified by the gratuitous torture of a Chinese prisoner, he had asked to be allowed to take part to make up for a perceived insult. During the so-called Rape of Nanking in December 1937, Japanese officers made Chinese prisoners kneel in rows, then practiced beheading them one by one with their samurai swords. Their soldiers were also ordered to carry out bandit practice on thousands of Chinese prisoners bound up or tied to trees. Any soldiers who refused were beaten severely by their NCOs. The Imperial Japanese Army's process of dehumanizing its troops was stepped up as soon as they arrived in China from the home islands. A Corporal Nakamura, who had himself been conscripted as a soldier against his will, described in his diary how they made some new recruits watch as they tortured five Chinese civilians to death. The newcomers were horrified. 
but Nakamura wrote, all new recruits are like this, but soon they will be doing the same things themselves. Their commanders, imbued with a sense of racial superiority and convinced of Japan's right to rule over East Asia, remained impervious, impervious to the fundamental contradiction that their war was supposed to free the region from Western tyranny. The Japanese army's treatment of conquered populations and defeated enemies dazed Westerners who'd never imagined such cruelty in modern times. Japanese officers talked of samurai honor, which in fact called for the generous treatment of the defeated, yet they never practiced it. They claimed that they were liberating Asia from Western colonialism, yet practiced a far worse, worse oppression themselves, which led to famine and economic collapse in every country they occupied. John Raba, the German businessman from Siemens, who courageously organized a safety zone in Nanking, wrote in his diary, I am totally puzzled by the conduct of the Japanese. On the one hand, they want to be recognized and treated as a great power on a level with European powers. On the other, they are currently displaying a crudity, brutality, and bestiality that bears no comparison except with the hordes of Genghis Khan. Imperial Japanese Navy pilots would play bridge together in what they considered a respectful imitation of Royal Navy officers in the wardroom, but they would behead any shot down American pilot pulled from the sea. Japan in the 1930s had become a dangerous combination of ancient culture and parvenu power. I think that the discovery which shocked me most was when writing this book was that Japanese officers did not merely condone, but actively encourage cannibalism, especially towards the end of the war. These were not isolated cases. A similar pattern was found across the army in China and Pacific garrisons who'd been cut off from supplies by the US Navy. It became clear from all the reports collected later by American authorities and the Australian war crimes section that the Widespread practice of cannibalism by Japanese soldiers in the Asia-Pacific War was something more than merely random incidents perpetrated by individuals or small groups subject to extreme conditions. The testimonies indicate that cannibalism was a systematic and organized military strategy. Both local populations and allied prisoners of war, I'm afraid especially those who remained loyal from the Indian Army, were kept alive as human cattle and then butchered for their meat one by one. Allied authorities, understandably afraid of the horror this would cause to the families of those who died in prison camps, decided to suppress the facts entirely. As a result, cannibalism never featured in the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal. In India, relations between the British and the Congress Party, which wanted independence for the country, had deteriorated even further right from the start. The pre-war Indian army of less than 200,000 men would be increased more than tenfold, with a large proportion of this immense force held back to maintain internal security. But the, but the, but the dilution of the professional army, fortunately for the British in East Asia, North Africa, Italy, and in Burma and Iraq, never really affected the fighting qualities of outstanding formations, such as the 4th Indian Division. Lord Linlithgow, the Viceroy, proved both arrogant and inept, politically and economically. In September 1939, he made no effort to consult the leaders of the Congress Party and obtain their support for the war. Churchill was no better, with his utterly romanticized notions of empire and mirage. Forced against his will to send a mission to India led by Sir Stafford Cripps, his least favorite politician, Churchill hated the idea of offering dominion status to India once the war was over him. Even that did little good. Mahatma Gandhi famously described the proposal as a post-dated check, and Congress leaders were deeply unimpressed. And as I'm sure you all you know, on the 8th of August 1942, prompted by Gandhi, Congress issued a call to the British to quit India at once, but to keep their troops there as defense against the Japanese. And next morning, the British authorities arrested its leaders. Demonstrations and riots followed with thousands of people killed and 100,000 or so thrown into jail. But the disturbances confirmed Churchill in his worst prejudice 
that the population of India was ungrateful and even treacherous. Although no excuse, it must, however, be remembered that Churchill bore an immense burden at such a critical moment of the war, when it looked as if as the string of British defeats would never end. The loss of Burma to the Japanese in the spring of 1942 reduced India's supplies of rice by 15%. Prices shot up, traders and merchants, in the hope of pushing up the price further, hoarded supplies, and an inflationary spiral began. The poor simply could not afford to eat, and the government in New Delhi did nothing to control this ferocious black market. It simply passed the responsibility to regional administrations, which reacted, as one writer described it, with insane provincial protectionism. And those with sur surpluses, such as Madras, refused to sell to those with acute shortages of grain. Bengal bore, of course, the brunt of the gathering disaster. At least 1.5 million died as a direct result of the famine and lasted in, from the end of 1942 and lasted all through the following year. And a similar number again are estimated to have perished through disease, cholera, malaria, and smallpox because they were so malnourished that they had no resistance. Churchill, already furious with India, refused to interfere with the shipping program to bring belief to bring relief, and only when Field Marshal Wavell was made Viceroy in September 1943 did the British Government of India begin to get a grip on the problem by using troops to distribute food reserves. Wavell made himself even more unpopular with Churchill by pursuing this policy. The whole episode was one of the most shameful in the history of the British Raj, and if nothing else, it completely undermined the imperialist argument that British rule protected the poor of India from the rich. Meanwhile, the British army, reeling from the humiliation of losing Malaya, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Burma, was not in a frame of mind to fight back for some time. Only in 1944, under General Bill Slim's impressive leadership, did morale really improve and the belief develop that they could outfight the Japanese. And although the cost-effectiveness of Chindit operations has been questioned by historians, there's no doubt that they did contribute greatly to a confidence that the Japanese enemy could be beaten in jungle fighting. Nevertheless, the, nevertheless, the British, Indian, and African troops in the 14th Army also found themselves, like the Americans, in their island fighting up against the Japanese, um, th their terrible talent for rapidly digging robust bunkers that were very, very hard to spot because of the brilliant camouflage. In the Pacific War, there was a marked difference in method and combat effectiveness between the US Marine Corps and the United States Army. The Marines believed in aggression and rapidity of attack. The US Army was much more bureaucratic and ponderous. The first step in the fight back, in island hopping as it was called, came in August 1942 with the first Marie U.S. Marine Corps Division uh, in their attack on Guadalcanal. And the Japanese, horrified at the American landing and seizure of the airfield there, sent in a regiment to deal with the problem, not appreciating uh, the full strength of the Marine force. And on the night of the 21st of August, their commander, Colonel Ichiki, ordered his men, around 1,000 strong, to attack through a mangrove swamp. And they were absolutely massacred by uh, the US Marines waiting for them. The fever was on us, wrote a Marine, of their bloodlust. More than 800 Japanese out of the 1,000 were killed in that particular engagement. Marine, to give an idea of the mentality also of that sort of war, Marine souvenir hunters stripped the fly-infested bodies of the Japanese of anything which might be worth bartering later uh, with US Navy sailors desperate for war trophies. A Japanese rising sun flag, known as a meatball, uh, went for a dozen large Hershey bars of chocolate, while a samurai sword fetched three dozen. And crocodiles soon congregated to feed on to feast on the Japanese corpses. And those Marines left huddling in their gun pits under the rain, listened to the crunching in the dark with rather mixed feelings. The Japanese then landed two more forces, one of divisional strength, but the Marines, even when outnumbered, inflicted devastating casualties. Japanese commanders, ashamed of not achieving success the first time, would launch suicidal banzai charges to wipe out the dishonor. Once the rainy season began, the downpours filled weapon pits and foxholes 
Bearded men shivered, soaked to the skin for days on end, surrounded by mud, perpetual damp, leeches, and jungle rot. The patrols and, sk and skirmishes had to be carried out in rain so dense that visibility was drastically reduced. The great priority was to keep the ammunition dry, and troops on both sides suffered from dysentery, malaria, dengue fever, and of course infected cuts and abrasions from jungle thorn. Marines found combat conditions even worse in subsequent island battles. Massive aerial and naval bombardment was no guarantee that marine casualties could be reduced. The 2nd Marine Division suffered 3,000 casualties in just over 24 hours in November 1943 when taking the tiny atoll of Tarawa. Photos of marine bodies rolling in the surf uh, shocked the American public. And when the Japanese were well dug in their bunk uh, to make their bunkers with uh, palm trunks, they could inflict very severe losses. The Marines countered with flamethrowers, satchel charges, and armored bulldozers burying them alive. Even flamethrowing tanks were used, which in a typical US Marine description turned the Japanese defenders into barbecued chicken. The more intelligent Japanese commanders, such as Lieutenant General Kuriabashi on Iwo Jima, and General Ushijima on Okinawa made no attempt to oppose the landings and forbade their men to waste their lives on any Banzai charges. They fought from networks of tunnels and caves enhanced with concrete, sliding doors, and even extractor fans to remove the cordite smoke. With well-protected field guns and interlocking fields of fire from machine gun posts, these were formidable defensive positions. By the 25th of March, 1945, when the battle for Iwo Jima ended, 6,821 Marines had been killed or mortally wounded, and another nearly 20,000 severely wounded. But apart from 54 Japanese severely wounded who were taken prisoner, Kuriabashi's force of 21,000 men had all fought to the death. The hatred felt by most US Marines and soldiers was hardened by Japanese suicidal resistance and by knowledge of their inhumane treatment of Allied prisoners of war. American troops, like most British troops in Burma, did not see their Japanese enemy as human. Some American Marines decapitated Japanese corpses in order to boil the head and sell the skull when they got home. On the 9th of May, 1945, when news of Germany's surrender reached the rifle companies of the 1st Marine Division on Okinawa, their reaction was, so what? They were exhausted and filthy, and everything around them stank. As far as they were concerned, the war in Europe was indeed another war on another planet. After the savage fighting on Okinawa, there remained the even more dreadful prospect of invading the Japanese home islands of Honshu and Hokkaido where soldiers and civilians alike were preparing to fight on to the death. None of the Marines then knew, of course, of the atomic bombs prepared in such secrecy. No other period in history offers so rich a choice, rich a source for the study of moral choice, individual and mass tragedy, the corruption of power politics, ideological hypocrisy, the egomania of some commanders, betrayal, perversity, unbelievable sadism, but also self-sacrifice and unpredictable compassion. In short, the Second World War defies generalization. But was it even a good war from the Allied point of view? As other historians have already emphasized, in Europe we sacrificed the freedom of the eastern half of Europe to save the western half. I don't believe there was any option in the circumstances but it should certainly put pay to any triumphalism. Just after the book had gone to the printers, I heard from a German friend that her sister's father-in-law had died. His most intense childhood memory came from January 1945 in East Prussia, when his mother took her children on foot across the frozen lagoon of the Frischershaf to escape the indiscriminate vengeance of the Red Army. The ice began breaking up all around with many people falling through to freeze and drown. Almost 70 years later as he lay dying, his last words were, I can hear the cracking of the ice. 
In the mad scheme of such a war, human life was intensely fragile. Survival was totally unpredictable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, if there are any questions, we'd uh, be glad to take them. I can see one over that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you can wait for the microphone, great. So my question is, uh, this walk uh, that stretched from Guadalcanal Canal to the uh, uh, forest of Bestone, so we say that out of every bad, there comes some good out of it. So what, according to you, was the greatest good that came out of the bloodiest war the mankind had ever seen, sir? What was the good that came out of the Second World War? What came out in terms of... Um, I think that the Second World War proved probably one of the most um, terrible and destructive, and if anything, it should be uh, a warning forever of the dangers of hatred, above all uh, racial and eth ethnic hatred, of what that can produce when it's taken to an extreme. I think we've seen the effects of propaganda. Uh, one saw the way that Goebbels, with a sort of diabolical ingenuity, realized that hatred alone was not enough. If you can combine hatred with fear, uh, then you produce probably the worst killing machine or killing potential uh, imaginable. And that is certainly what he did in preparing Germans for the invasion of the Soviet Union, and we see the effects. And that was also very similar with uh, the Japanese invasion of China and the sort of horrors that we saw there as well. Uh, I can't see with these lights. But the lady over here? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Sir, thank you for a very stimulating talk. And could you say something about your research methods? Because national governments uh, are often very sensitive about releasing um, what happened. Uh, we're only just learning about the bombing of Darwin. And I don't think the Japanese have ever said anything much about the, co the treatment of comfort women, both Indonesian and Korean. How do you get these facts? apart from official sources? Thank you. Well, you're, it's, a, it's a very important question. I mean, I was incredibly lucky with timing when I was doing my book on Stalingrad and others because um, the uh, Russian archives, the former Soviet archives, were first opened really in 1992. And in fact, the military archives were then forced by the Minister of Archives at the time, Pikoya, who'd been appointed by Yeltsin, and they were forced to open up. And so when we went in, um, the Russians didn't really know, or rather the Russian colonels and so forth we were dealing with, didn't really know how to handle foreign historians. They'd never imagined um, that Soviet secrets would ever be opened up to foreign gays. Um, and that many of the t a lot of the time they were trying to block us, but it was a little bit like playing scissors, paper, stone. You know, one would have to try and get round it some other way, and you could often find material in another archive which had been blocked in one archive because copies had been sent to another department. Um, Japan is a good example in a way. Um, Ian Kershaw teased me. He said, you may, you, you may have thought you had trouble getting into the Russian archives. You should try the Japanese archives. Um, and it's absolutely true. Uh, the Japanese have not been, shall we say, very open uh, in terms of access to material. And it, we, there will be, obviously, rev revelations coming out in the future. Um, and I think it would be very interesting to see what is discovered. But one must pay credit to young, uh, younger Japanese historians who are starting to, to dig away. Uh, just as in Russia, although there is a, a sort of a nationalist version of events, particularly under Putin, uh, which more or less sort of supports the old Stalinist line on the Second World War, uh, there are younger historians who are in, incredibly brave uh, in digging for the material and in publishing it. 
So, you know, one's got to remain hopeful for the future. But one of the most frightening elements is the quality of the wartime paper is so bad, particularly in the Russian archives, that however carefully you turn over the pages, you see the, you see the paper virtually disintegrating under your hands. Uh, and that is frightening because they haven't microfilmed it. There, isn't, there aren't alternative sources. So, you know, the future and the uh, no perfect history will ever be written in that sense. We, don't, we will never know everything. Um, and we have to accept history is not a science. History can only be a branch of literature. It is not a perfect, it is certainly not a perfect um, medium, if you like, or whatever in that particular way. Over here and then there. Good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how relevant this question of mine would be in this perspective. One thing I wanted to know how much of uh, the dropping of atom bomb on Japan in the Second World War finds a place in your book, and how do you see it, uh, uh, the effects of this till today in the world, po world politics and world determination of geography? Well, the, obviously the dropping, you're quite right, the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan has always been one of the most controversial um, aspects of the Second World War. What one has to also look into is that although there were one or two members within the government, but civilian members uh, in the government who wanted to negotiate with the United States, um, they had no power whatsoever. The power was entirely in the hands of the generals at that particular time who were determined not to surrender under any circumstances, partly because they had told their troops that you must never surrender and, you know, you, you must kill yourself before you die, uh, before, you, before anything else happens. Now, certain hi historians have recently been estimating what would have happened if the uh, invasion of the home islands had had to go ahead. Uh, the Allies estimated that up to a half a million uh, British, uh, American, and other um, Australian, um, Indian troops who would have been used in the, uh, in the invasion of Japan, at least half a million of them would probably have been killed. But they're now estimating that between two and eight million Japanese civilians would have died if the invasion had had to go ahead in 1946 because of starvation, by that stage, if the, the war would have dragged on into 1946, so that the famine would have been appalling. Um, but also because the uh, military were going to force the Japanese civilians, uh, civilians to fight back with bamboo lances and with satchel charges strapped to their bodies like suicide bombers um, and being forced to throw themselves against American tanks when they landed. So, I mean, the, 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 the scenario would have been appalling. So, on that basis, one can argue that the numbers killed by the atomic bombs uh, of Japanese civilians would have been far, far smaller um, than would have been the case if the atomic bombs had not been dropped and a full invasion of the islands of Japan had had to take, uh, take place. Now, I know that that would not be a very popular argument if I tried to make it in Japan. I'd probably be lynched. Um, but I think that there is a certain amount of um, justification behind it. But with any luck, the horrors of those atomic bombs um, have certainly, one would hope, have taught the world that nuclear weapons should never be resorted to. Gosh, more and more hands. Yes. Uh, my question is practically the extension of the previous question. <coughs> Your reasons for the dropping of the bombs is really not very convincing at all. In my opinion, the most sinful act of the entire war was dropping of these two bombs, particularly because, firstly, the end of the war was there for everybody to see, and secondly, the bombs were th thrown against civilian populations. Thank you. The, the bombing of a civilian population, of course, is in theory, certainly, in th at least in theory, as of course against um, the rules of war. But once it had been started on both sides, it was going to be, it was going to be um, inevitably going to be carried on. The question is, you know, what would have been, what was the, any, the best way of shortening the war? Um, and I don't know, with, I'm not saying in any way that it's morally justifiable, but uh, certainly the evidence seems to indicate uh, as I said, that fewer would have died uh, as a result of the drop bombs being dropped than if the conventional war has had to fight all the way through the 
um, through the home islands of Japan. Now, we don't know. Maybe there might have been a collapse later. Maybe uh, the generals continuing the war might have changed their mind. I don't know. But um, I'm afraid that's all one can say. I don't think that the historians are really in a position um, to make, shall we say, moral lectures. I think they can only uh, indicate, indicate the facts. I think it's really up to the, the reader uh, to, make the, to make the moral judgment. I wouldn't dare do it in those particular circumstances. I think, it's a, um, I think it was, frankly, an impossible decision uh, which, the, say, the commanders uh, were faced with. Uh, interestingly, uh, Roosevelt was wondering whether, you know, the atomic bombs should be used against Germany, but uh, when he was told that they wouldn't be ready until August 1945 uh, by General Groves, who was the head of the Manhattan Project, um, that was one of the reasons for sort of, you know, postponing the decision, but by then, of course, Roosevelt was dead. At least we've got some more over the left. Yeah, this chair. Ah. Uh, thanks. So a couple of my things got uh, summed up here. It's basically towards Japan mm -hmm. and uh, the way Germans were perceived. It was always, as you were saying, Japanese uh, were not even considered human. By, uh, I'm saying post almost uh, the end of the First World, the whole Holocaust thing was very clear. Everyone knew, basically Europeans had this thing, oh, these are our cousins, they've just gone astray. But with a way, Japanese were the other ones. They were always referred to as cockroaches, vermin. They were, as you were saying, they would lynch each other. They would lynch and hang their heads and stuff like that. So uh, even after the Holocaust came out, uh, Japan still was lower. You know what I mean? So why was that? And also the uh, bombing thing that you're talking about, the Manhattan Project finally got its through only in June. I think so. And by then, Germany was defeated. The, I think so the whole point of dropping the atomic bomb was to intimidate uh, Stalin, or rather the Soviet Union. Dude, don't we ha already have it? That, that's, I, I'm quoting mostly from uh, Max Hastings, all had let loose, Inferno. Yeah, thank you. Um, there is, well, I don't think we can ever really prove, because there are no, I don't think there are any documents over what point um, Truman was influenced by the idea of intimidating the Soviet Union. I think it's a distinct possibility. I certainly wouldn't rule it out, but I don't think that there is anything which sort of clearly indicates that that was in his mind. I think the one thing that the Americans were afraid of was of the massive casualties which their own troops would have suffered uh, when they invaded. And this, in fact, brings out, a t I think, one, a terrible paradox in a way, which I notice very much when studying the battle for Normandy. And that is that democratic countries quite often are more likely to kill more civilians because their generals are under much more pressure and from parliament, from the press and the public opinion at home uh, to reduce their own casualties. Um, that doesn't happen in, with dictatorships. Um, ironically, um, and that's why the uh, armies of, de uh, of democracies tend to rely that much more on explosive, on bombs and shells and so forth, uh, in an attempt to reduce the deaths of their own people. So I think that one was playing a very large part in uh, the mentality of um, Truman at that particular stage. But even Roosevelt, uh, who was regarded as extremely, uh, much more, the most liberal, if you like, of all, um, he had no compunction about the idea of using uh, the atomic bomb. So I don't think one can sort of generalize too much in that particular way. Um, finally, I mean, on, on, this, on this particular point, the question of, um, uh, of the racist attitudes, um, it's very, very difficult to tell what, at certain points, particularly, funny enough, during the First World War, when the Japanese were seen as allies of the, British and the of the British and the Americans at the end of the First World War, um, they were seen almost as honorary Europeans. I um, hate to use that particular phrase, but that was certainly the phrase used at the time. Um, during the course of the Second World War, though, that attitude changed dramatically, uh, mainly because of the treatment of Allied prisoners. And once news of, for example, the Bataan Death March uh, got back to the United States, uh, there was no doubt about it. This was when um, a sort of a, a visceral racist loathing and hatred uh, emerged very much amongst American and also, it must be said, British troops as well. I think, well, well, I think we've uh, reached the end of our session. I know there are lots of people who are very anxious to ask questions, but...
uh, we really, really need to call it today. So on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you very much, Anthony. It's been a uh, <laughs>